So the title of today's first lecture is the rather intriguing other ligands. So what we're going to do here is going to round up a number of ligands that are important in organometallic chemistry. And in these cases, the existence or the presence of these ligands doesn't necessarily render our compound organometallic, but they do fit very nicely into this lecture course, and so that's why we're going to look at them here. Now, before we do that, this isn't on your slide, but it is, of course, one of the crucial recurring themes, which we just can't get enough of, and we can't practice enough. So here we have a compound that we would have encountered in the last lecture. This is the sodium salt, but it really, doesn't really matter that this is a sodium salt if you must include sodium. Clearly, sodium is donating zero electrons to this complex. So what we are looking at here is the cobalt tetracarbonyl anion. And it's a how many electron species? I'm sure if some of us have got bits of paper. The others are perfectly happy to murmur or speak more loudly. So that is an 18 electron compound. And that is well within the scope of what we looked at so far. Some of these other ligands we will cover in the next couple of lectures, indeed today, these cyclopentadienol ligands we will cover in our uh, Friday lecture, which is the one that's... So what we're going to do here is to look at some of these ligands, but you should already know from your table what the electron count is. Very simply, these are carbon-based ligands, and you can see from these diagrams immediately how many of these carbon atoms are bonded to the metal. So if you want to know how many electron donor it is, it's that simple. Now, when you have a uh, ligand that is bonding through an aromatic or a, an extended pi system, then it's not normal to draw bonds to all of the carbon atoms because your diagrams very quickly get very cluttered, especially when you are trying to represent some three-dimensional structure in your molecule. So what we normally do is to just to put a single bond to the middle of our delocalized aromatic system. But here we would have three electrons ligand because this is three carbon atoms bonded to the nickel. So if that's the case, how many electron species is this one? Yes, it's a 16 electron compound. And this bis allyl nickel compound, as we would call it, does actually exist. It is a stable 16, well, it's quite reactive, but it is a stable 16 electron uh, organometallic compound. Now here we have an example of the sort of molecule that Dr. Redshaw will belittle in 3C32 and I spent my PhD working with, a metallocene dialkyl compound. So this titanium, this will be called titanocene dimethyl, but what's its electron count? Yes, it's another 16 electron compound. How do you arrive at 16 electrons? Well, a cyclopentadienyl ligand, here we're drawing a single bond to the middle of our delocalized system. There are five carbons in a cyclopentadienyl ligand, so it is a five electron donor. Two five electron donors plus four from titanium because it's in group four, is 14. An alkyl ligand is a one electron donor, so that is a 16 electron species. And finally, this anionic compound here. Now note, what I would normally have done is to draw square brackets around my compound and indicate that the negative charge is delocalized across the entire molecular species or anionic species. But occasionally you won't see that. Organic chemists tend to center their localized or localize their charge, shall we say. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're adding an electron in exactly the same fashion. So I would like to see square brackets and a negative charge on the whole species, but this means exactly the same thing. Good. So most people think that is yes. Well, remember what he said in transition metal chemistry. In main group chemistry, you're used to applying VSEPR, and you have to find the number of non-bonding pairs, lone pairs. In transition metal chemistry, there may be lone pairs present, but they are not stereochemically active. They do not influence the shape of our molecule. So if we want to know what the shape of our molecule is, we just look at the ligands that are actually present. So in the case of this cobalt tetracarbonyl anion, that's clearly been drawn to be tetrahedral. 
and it will be tetrahedral because you've got four ligands and you want to arrange them in space as far apart as possible. In the case of this bicyclopentaenal titanium dimethyl compound, as I say normally we'd call that titanosine dimethyl, here you have essentially a tetrahedral disposition of the ligands that you've got present. But some people might choose to argue that a cyclopentadienyl ligand actually takes up more than one coordination space. But for the ligands that we actually have, they're going to be arranged in space as far apart as possible, and you have essentially a tetrahedral geometry. But of course, this ligand is taking up a lot more space than a methyl ligand, so that will me tend to mean that the angle between the two CP ligands is bigger than you'd find in an ideal tetrahedral molecule, and the angle that you find between the two alkyl groups is smaller than the angle you'd find in an ideal tetrahedron. But it is a distorted tetrahedral geometry. And then again here, essentially it's the same thing. You have four ligands, you're going to arrange them in space as much as possible. What shape is this nickel, bisallyl nickel compound? Well, that, well, we'll see many examples of what we would call sandwich compounds. What you have here, essentially a linear arrangement, but these are face-on allyls. So you're essentially making a sandwich of your nickel between two allyl ligands. Does that answer the question? Yes. Great. Okay. Let's move on to look at our other ligands. And the other ligands that we're going to start off with is nitric oxide. So complexes of nitric oxide. So if you have a compound that contains only <coughs> nitric oxide ligands, is it organometallic? No. Clearly it's not organometallic because it won't include any metal carbon bonds. So why am I dealing with nitric oxide ligands? Well, nitric oxide ligands give nitrosyl compounds. These are very, very similar to carbonyl compounds. Because if you draw a molecular orbital diagram for nitric oxide, it will look just like the molecular orbital diagram for carbon monoxide, with one exception. If you move from carbon to nitrogen, you get one more electron. And that one more electron is going to go into what was the lowest occupied molecular orbital, and hope everybody can remember, because it's quite important in this chemistry, that was a pi star orbital. So the MO diagram of nitric oxide looks just like the MO diagram of carbon monoxide, except that we already have one electron in that pi star orbital. Otherwise, it's going to have a pair of electrons on the nitrogen, which it can donate to the metal centre, just like the carbon in carbon monoxide has a pair of electrons. And it can also act as a pi acceptor ligand. If you imagine that the ligand is not nitric oxide, but actually nitric oxide, once, it's been, uh, once an electron has been removed, i.e. the ligand is NO+, then NO+, is entirely isoelectronic to carbon monoxide. And so it's not surprising that there's some great similarities between the chemistry of carbon monoxide and nitric oxide. Now you won't often see this statement here, NO plus is a stronger pi acceptor than carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a very strong pi acceptor, we've seen how important that is in its chemistry. NO plus is an even stronger pi acceptor and there aren't many examples of stronger pi acceptors than carbon monoxide. Now, what you've got with NO is a situation where it can bond in one of two different modes. If it is bonding much like the bonding in carbon monoxide, then it is essentially donating its pair of electrons on the nitrogen, plus it is donating the odd electron, which is present in that pi star orbital. So if it's donating 2 plus 1, it is a 3 electron donor. So if you have linear NO, Linear NO is a three electron donor. There is another bonding mode for nitric oxide whereby it does not donate the lone pair. If it's not donating the lone pair, it is only donating the radical odd electron in the pi star orbital, then it is clearly only donating one electron, and in those conditions it's a one electron donor, but it won't be linear. It is only linear when you take the lone pair on the nitrogen and you bond it straight on to the transition metal. If you're not using that lone pair, then it will be bent with respect to the metal-nitrogen-oxygen axis, and the lone pair will be sitting out here not bonded to the transition metal species. And that brings in an interesting possibility. If you have a ligand 
and we'll see another one towards the end of this lecture, the Allart ligand. If you have a ligand that can adopt two different bonding modes, a three electron bonding mode and a one electron bonding mode, then you can have some interesting chemistry taking place. Because if you start off with a species that uh, essentially has, is bonding in a three electron mode, could give an 18 electron compound, you can then essentially just add another ligand to it. And if you add another ligand to an 18 electron compound, you can't do that to get up to a 20 electron compound. We know that. But there is another way of adding the ligand. You can go from the three electron coordination mode of your nitric oxide ligand to a one electron coordination mode of your nitric oxide and not exceed the 18 electron rule. So you have the property of the ligand that can bind in a three electron or a one electron fashion and that opens up the possibility of introducing a new ligand into the coordination sphere. Now, we have a very close relationship. You've got very great similarity between NO compounds and CO compounds, except that where NO is binding in a linear fashion, as it will do in most cases, it is a three electron donor. So if we take an element like chromium, in order to make a stable homoleptic carbonyl compound, we needed to have six CO ligands, because a CO ligand donates two electrons each. So chromium forms chromium hexacarbonyl. But if you have NO ligands, NO ligands will donate three electrons each. So how many NO ligands do you need in order to make a stable 18 electron compound? Yes, four. So what you get here is again a series of compounds which obey the 18 electron rule. NO compounds obey the 18 electron rule for exactly the same reasons that carbon monoxide compounds obey the 18 electron rule. But remember that an NO ligand in a linear fashion is a three electron donor, so this time we only need three of them. And what we can do is we can move across the periodic table from chromium through manganese, and every time we add an electron because we're moving to the right in the periodic table, then we can replace an NO ligand with a CO ligand. So if we add an electron because we're going from left to right in the periodic table, then we can replace one of the NO ligands with a ligand that is only donating two electrons. And what you end up with is what we would call an isoelectronic. I think we all know what that means. Isoelectronic means they all have the same number of electrons, i.e. 18, and they all have the same structure. They are isostructural. They are all tetrahedral species. They're all going to have a tetrahedral structure because they have four ligands. They're all linearly bound ligands and they'll be arranged in space to keep them apart as much as possible. Isocyanide ligands. Now, what is an isocyanide ligand? Well, isocyanide ligands sometimes get confused with species that they are actually capable of isomerizing with. So if I was to draw this kind of a ligand, it's a nitrile. And nitriles are ligands towards transition metals. They will donate a pair of electrons on the nitrogen to a metal. Let's just put M here. So nitriles are ligands. But if you have a compound of a nitrile ligand, does that make it organometallic? No, it doesn't make it organometallic because it is bonded via the nitrogen. Isocyanide ligands look annoyingly like nitrile ligands, only this time what we've got is the carbon and the nitrogen the other way around. And this species here is capable of ele donating electron density to a metal through this lone pair. Now, an NR fragment is isoelectronic to an O. NR has exactly the same number of electrons as oxygen. So what does this ligand resemble? Yeah, it resembles carbon monoxide. It behaves very similarly to carbon monoxide. And what do we mean by that? We mean that this species here also has pi star orbitals. It has a lone pair on carbon which it donates, and it has pi star orbitals which are not occupied, which can accept electron density from our transition metal center. So an isocyanide ligand bonds in essentially the same way as a carbon monoxide ligand. A little bit of detail onto those bones. Although it bonds in exactly the same way as an isocyanide ligand, it is a better donor. So this lone pair of electrons is higher in energy and so bonds more strongly. 
So an isocyanide log ligand is a better donor, a better sigma donor. But it is a worse pi acceptor. So it is not as good as accepting electron density from the metal centre as our carbon monoxide ligand was. So there's a difference in the balance of the bonding of isocyanide ligands versus carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide was a pretty weak donor, but a very good acceptor. Isocyanides are better donors and weaker acceptors. And what that means, of course, is that isocyanide compounds are capable of stabilising higher oxidation states. Carbon monoxide was very good at stabilising the low oxidation states with high metal electron density, which it accepted into its pi star orbitals in backbonding fashion. Isocyanides are better at stabilising higher oxidation states because they rely more on donation and less on accepting. And so what you end up with are compounds like these. This is manganese isocyanide, or hexisocyanide, dication. So that looks a lot more like a classical transition metal compound. I think you'll agree. This is an octahedral compound with six donors on it, and it's a dication. Why are these compounds? Well, they strictly fulfil the definition of organometallic because they've got metal carbon bonds in them. These compounds are uh, important because, well, in coordination chemistry they're important because these isocyanide compounds, you can get an isocyanide compound of, of manganese and you can go one place down in the periodic table and you can get isocyanide compounds of technetium. Now these isocyanide compounds of technetium as dications are soluble in water. They are soluble in biological medium. And so it is technetium isocyanide compounds that have been used in radio imaging of the heart. So if you inject one of these species into the heart, you can then image the radiation emitted by these species. So it's not entirely harmless process. So you can radio image the heart from the radioactive decay products of technetium samples injected into there. This technique is tending to be used somewhat less often now because we have less um, ethically questionable techniques that don't involve injecting radioactive samples, but there are still some methods that involve the use of radio-labeled species. How do we make these species? Well, remember I said to you that this kind of reaction is pretty rare. It is unusual to be able to systematically substitute for all of the carbon monoxide ligands. We said that that was difficult to do because as remaining carbonyl ligands are present, backbonding to those that are left gets stronger and stronger and it gets harder and harder to remove carbon monoxide ligands. This is an exception. In the case of nickel tetracarbonyl, we can replace all of the carbon monoxide ligands with isocyanide, phenyl isocyanide ligands, here. And the reason this works, of course, is because of the similarities in the bonding of carbon monoxide and isocyanide ligands. Now, here's a big topic for us to get our teeth into. Phosphine ligands. Phosphine ligands, well, we could argue that, of course, any compound that contains a phosphorus alkyl is an organometallic species in its own right, and we've touched upon that. We touched upon the organometallic chemistry of group 15. Phosphine ligands are very, very important in organometallic chemistry, not as wonderful organometallic species, but as supporting ligands for our transition metal species. Why are phosphine ligands so special? Well, first point to note about phosphine ligands is they are two electron donors. So if we're doing electron counting, the most important fact about a phosphine ligand is there is a pair of electrons on the phosphorus, a lone pair of electrons on the phosphorus, so it's a two electron donor. Whenever you're counting electrons, it's a two electron donor. And there are two important things that you can vary about a phosphine ligand. The thing about a carbon monoxide ligand is there's only one carbon monoxide ligand. You can't vary the properties of a carbon monoxide ligand. It is what it is. It has a very, very little steric profile, and it is a good acceptor ligand and a poor donor ligand. There's nothing you can do about that. Isocyanides are a little bit different. We can tailor the alkyl group on here. But in the case of a phosphine ligand, we have three different groups that we can tailor. The phosphine ligand is PR3, and you can change 
all of those R groups. And you can change them to achieve two different goals. All of chemistry, all of chemistry variations can be ascribed to one of two things. They're either electronic factors or they are steric factors. And in a phosphine ligand, we can vary the steric profile of our phosphine ligand and we can vary its electronic properties. And we do that by tweaking, changing those R groups. So here we have two sets of properties, electronic properties and uh, the steric influence. Let's start off with the electronic properties. So what you've got are three R groups that you can vary. Now what we'd like to have is a system where we can monitor the effect of varying the R groups. That's what we'd like to do, have a model compound where we can play around <coughs> changing the R groups and see what effects that has on the electronic properties. Well, if you think about it, we have an idea how to do this. We know that the carbon-oxygen stretching frequency is a very, very good probe for electron density on the metal center. Accepted? So that's a very good probe. Now, what we'd like to do is separate out, and this isn't always possible in chemistry, but we'd like to be able to separate out the steric and the electronic factors. So what we use is a compound where we can put just one phosphine ligand on and the sterics are not very important. Such a compound is this one here. So a phosphine nickel tricarbonyl. CO ligand, carbonyl ligand is a very small ligand. Nickel is a fairly hefty transition metal, so there's no steric problems in sticking one phosphine ligand on a species like this. So we wouldn't expect the phosphine ligands to clash with the CO ligands and for sterics to have much of an influence in this system. So what we can do is systematically vary our phosphine ligand and see what effect that has on the carbon-oxygen stretching frequency of a phosphine nickel tricarbonyl compound. Now, before I show you the results for that, so far we have discussed in detail the bonding of carbon monoxide to transition metals. And what I expect you to know is that there are two, essentially two bonding contributions in the bonding of carbon monoxide to transition metals. There is a sigma donor contribution, the lone pair on the carbon being donated to the metal, and that's a classical donor interaction. And also, of course, the CO has vacant pi star orbitals and accepts electron density from the transition metal. And that is back bonding or the ligand acting as a pi acid. Now a phosphine ligand can do the same two things. The phosphine ligand, in the first instance, is obvious, I hope, that it is going to be a sigma donor. Because here we have a nice fat pair of electrons sitting on the phosphorus ready to be donated into a vacant orbital on the transition metal centre. And this should be a very, very familiar pattern. This is a classical donor interaction for a phosphine. The thing that's a little bit more difficult to get your head around in a phosphine ligand is, OK, Dr Lancaster says it can act as a pi acceptor ligand. How? It's obvious in carbon monoxide that you have pi bonds and you have pi, or you have pi orbitals and you have pi star orbitals. What we need on a phosphine ligand in order for it to act as a pi acceptor is an orbital which is vacant and has pi symmetry with respect to the metal phosphorus axis. So what is that orbital? Well, there was a lot of discussion about this for years, and if you have a very old copy of a textbook that perhaps you've inherited from somebody, you might see it discussed in terms of vacant d orbitals on phosphorus. Well, that's no longer believed to be the case. The vacant orbitals that are present on phosphine ligands that have the right symmetry to accept electron density from the transition metal are believed to be sigma star orbitals. So these are sigma star anti-bonding orbitals with respect to the phosphorus-carbon bond. Now, to a first approximation, what do these bond or these orbitals look like? They look a bit like this. So what we've got is an unoccupied sigma star orbital on the phosphine ligand, and that has exactly the right pi symmetry to accept electron density from the transition metal centre. So a phosphine ligand can act as a sigma donor and a pi acceptor, just like carbon monoxide does. But when I say just like carbon monoxide, be very careful how you represent your orbitals that are actually doing 
this chemistry. Now, it is certainly true that normally a phosphine ligand is a much better donor and a much worse acceptor than a carbon monoxide ligand. So phosphine ligands are much better donors than carbon monoxide and much poorer acceptors. But the point is here that we can vary those properties by changing the R groups. So you've all done extensive organic chemistry, or most of you have done extensive organic chemistry. Those of you who have, what would be the effect of putting bulky alkyl groups on the phosphorus? What kind of effect does a methyl versus an ethyl versus a T-butyl group have? It pushes electron density in, exactly. These things have a positive inductive effect. So the if you move from a methyl to an ethyl to a tertiary butyl group, what you're doing is increasing the positive inductive effect. That is pumping electron density into the phosphine. If you pump electron density into the phosphine, you make it a better donor and you make it a worse acceptor. So any group that donates electron density makes it a better acceptor. Any group that removes electron density any group that donates electron density makes it a better donor. Any group that accepts electronic density is going to make it a better acceptor. Now, can you think of a substituent we can put on phosphorus that will make the phosphine ligand a better acceptor of electron density? So what about in organic chemistry? If you wanted to make a benzene ring or something more electron deficient, what sort of substituents would you put on it? Halogens, okay, and which is the most electronegative halogen of them all? Fluorine. So PF3, or in, uh, to some extent if you have a trifluoromethyl substituent, if you put lots of fluorine into these species, then you can make them good pi acceptor ligands. But only if you have very strongly electron withdrawing groups on there. So let's have a look at our table. So that's what people have done, and people have spent a lot of time systematically varying these and making spectroscopic observations. So let's see if it's borne out in here. If we have um, a situation where you use T-butyl phosphine ligand, so this is the flabbiest phosphine ligand you, you can conveniently use. You could perhaps design something a little bit more so, but it would be quite difficult. So commercially, the Tris T-butyl phosphine ligand is available. That has the lowest value of CO stretching frequency on our table. What has the highest value of CO stretching frequency? Well, not surprisingly, it's the trifluoride. And the trifluoride value here, this CO stretching frequency is very similar to the one that you find in the parent compound, nickel tetracarbonyl, which you also have in your notes. So what we have is a situation where the more electron density you have on the phosphine ligand, the more donation it gives, that will increase the electron density on the transition metal nickel centre. That will mean that more electron density can be back donated into remaining carbon monoxide ligands, causing these carbon monoxide ligands, or occupying the pi star orbitals, causing the carbon monoxide ligands to stretch at lower frequencies. So there's quite a story there, tracing it from one ligand into an effect that we observe in a second ligand. So generally, alkyl ligands are good donors and poor acceptors, and phosphine halide species are good acceptors and poor donors. The same is also true for phosphite ligands. So if you have an OR substituent, and some of you, well, many of you now, will have encountered. Anybody encountered a phosphite ligand? Yeah? So you use triphenyl phosphite as your ligand in the cobalt experiment. So what you have there is a situation where you have a relatively electron withdrawing phosphine ligand. And so now we should recognize the difference between a phosphine ligand like PH3 and a phosphite ligand like this one here, a significant difference in the electron donating properties. So when the student confuses triphenyl phosphine to, for triphenyl phosphite, we have an insight into why the chemistry doesn't work properly anymore. That's electronic properties in these ligands. Now we need to talk about the steric properties of these ligands. So what you can do, obviously, is bulk up your alkyl substituents on the phosphorus. So we can increase the size of our alkyl substituents. So it's immediately obvious to us that a T-butyl group is bigger than a methyl group. I think you'll agree. 
Now, what people do, or what people have done, is get lots and lots of crystal structures of transition metal phosphine complexes. And when you look at these transition metal phosphine complex structures, what you find is that you could look at them classically in crystallography. What we would do is we would look at the carbon-phosphorus-carbon -carbon bond angle. And we would use that as a measure of the steric hindrance associated with the ligand. But if you do that, you just look at the carbon-phosphorus-carbon, -carbon, what you're doing is you're neglecting all the flab, as I've been calling it, other people might call it chicken fat, that is sitting around your alkyl ligand. So the bigger your alkyl ligand, it's actually forming an umbrella protecting the metal centre. And so a better way of looking at the size of an alkyl ligand is not to look simply at the carbon-phosphorus-carbon -carbon bond angles in these species, but it is to look at the so-called cone angle. And the cone angle is defined by taking the outermost limit of your blob of alkyl ligand on both sides and finding the angle between those. And that's our so-called cone angle in these systems. And you can see from this table here that these cone angles vary enormously. If you take the smallest conceivable phosphine ligand, the smallest conceivable phosphine ligand would be pH 3. And the cone angle for pH 3 is only 87 degrees. So it is taking up very little space around our species here. We can play all sorts of games in phosphorus chemistry and we can substitute lots of different species onto here and so the bigger the alkyl group gets, the larger the cone angles get. But sometimes these things are a little bit counterintuitive and we have to think about it a little while. So what we have here is obviously an increase to trimethylphosphine, an increase to T-butylphosphine, but what about this species here? This is triphenylphosphine and that has a cone angle of only 145 degrees. What about this paraorthotolyl? What does that mean? What is an orthotolyl group? Well, we've got phosphorus. What is tolyl? What does that suggest to you? Yes, yeah, derived from toluene. And ortho means that what we're going to have, what we're going to have in our system is a species that is derived from toluene, but the methyl group is in this position. So what happens, of course, is that this group is rotating, rotating about the phosphorus carbon axis and sweeping out an area of space. And that area of space is dramatically increased by sticking an orthomethyl group here. So this species, electronically, is very similar to triphenylphosphine, but sterically, that's triphenylphosphine that just doesn't have this methyl group. Sterically, that's 145 degrees, and this is 194. Now, 194 is bigger than linear, so uh, it's scooping out an area of space around the metal about as big as my arms are sweeping to. So it is covering an enormous amount of space around our transition metal. And clearly, if you've got something that is sweeping out 194 degrees around your metal, there's not many of these phosphine ligands that you could fit around the metal. You're never going to get four ligands sweeping 194 degrees around a single transition metal. So this has the effect of introducing a huge steric umbrella, if you like, and that steric umbrella is going to have dramatic consequences because it's going to mean that we cannot achieve a fully electronically saturated species because we are filling all the available space with this great fat phosphine ligand. And so you can basically insist upon force electronic deficiency into your system by having very bulky phosphine ligands. So let's look at alkene complexes. So the first alkene complex was Zyzer's salt. Now, of course, Zyzer did not know he'd made an alkene complex. What he did know is that he was refluxing the platinum tetrachloride dianion in ethanol. And when he was refluxing this species in ethanol, what he isolated is a species with this elemental formula. And although they didn't have NMR and they didn't have crystallography, what they did have was the ability to do very, very accurate elemental analyses. So they could tell that it was this compound, but it wasn't for many, many years afterwards that they knew how these particular atoms were related together in the element. 
This is an example of generating an alkene ligand in situ by essentially decomposing the ethanol. There are more direct routes to make alkene compounds, so we can have ligand substitution. So this is an example of a ligand substitution reaction. This is our old friend now, iron pentacarbonyl. And you know that if you irradiate that, you can displace one of the CO ligands. Before we were interested in that as CO substitutions, now, of course, we recognize it as making an alkene compound. Here's another example. This is butadiene. If you react butadiene and heat with pentacarbonyl, uh, iron pentacarbonyl, then you can make a butadiene iron compound. And you'll recognize that both of these species are 18 electron complexes. You can also do addition, direct addition, without substituting anything to compounds that do not already have 18 electrons. So if we look at this, this is Vasquez complex. Vasquez complex will become more important later in your chemistry careers, but Vasquez complex is a square planar iridium-1 compound. This square planar iridium-1 compound is one of those that we said right at the offset of electron counting is likely to obey the 16 electron rule. It's a 16 <laughs> electron compound. But it will add a alkene ligand as a two electron donor to give us an 18 electron compound like that one. And we can also have examples of doing, forming alkene compounds in situ through reductive mechanisms. So this is rhodium trichloride. Rhodium trichloride hydrate species, if you dissolve that in ethanol in the presence of ethene, then what you get is the formation of a dimeric compound. So what is the electron count of this compound with respect to one rhodium, uh, one rhodium set? Okay, it's a 16 electron compound. Actually, hopefully looking at this, we'll actually recognize that this is one of those rhodium-1 square planar compounds, so it hopefully will not surprise us to believe that it is indeed a 16 and not an 18 electron compound. But we can count electrons very easily if we have a periodic table available. Rhodium is in which group of the periodic table? It's in group 9. It's under cobalt in group 9. Um, and so what you have here is 9 electrons, then an alkene ligand is a 2 electron donor. So we have two two-electron donors, that will be a 13-electron species. This is a normal covalent bond, so it's a one-electron donor. That will give us 14. And this is a dative covalent bond, so it is a two-electron donor, giving us 16. So that's a 16-electron square planar rhodium compound. Now, here's another interesting reaction. This is so-called metal atom synthesis. Metal atom synthesis is a remarkable synthetic method for making very bizarre compounds. So what you do in metal atom synthesis is exactly what it says. You basically produce atoms of the metal. So you're not reacting it with the metallic form. You're doing it under high vacuum and at a temperature where you turn your metal into a vapor. And when you expose that vapour to ligands, you get complexes that you would not get any other way. So if you do that with iron, and this species here, which is 1,5-cyclooctadiene, so this is a non-conjugated diene, two of these beasts add to our iron to give us the 1,5-cod-twice iron compound. And that's described as being thermally unstable. So there's probably a clue there. Why is this species thermally unstable? Why would you predict that it's thermally unstable? Well, whenever you're asked to predict the stability of something, the first thing you should look at is its electron count. So what is its electron count? Yes, it's a 16 electron compound. This 16 electron compound doesn't have the excuse of being square planar. This is a 16 electron iron zero compound, and as such, it's not going to be particularly stable. And indeed, you can't make it any other way unless you use this metal atom synthesis route. Now, the most important point here is so far we've looked at the bonding of CO ligands and we have looked at the bonding of phosphine ligands. Here is another one to add to our collection. This is the bonding of alkene ligands. And this is where I want to finish today's lecture, looking at the bonding of alkene ligands. Now, an alkene ligand clearly bonds to a transition metal. And all those examples that you've seen, very importantly, because this is one area where students do sometimes become confused, is that the alkene ligand is bonded side-on like this. It is never seen bonded end-on. Remember the CO ligand bonds end-on. 
the alkene ligand does not. So, now, if I was to say to you that an alkene ligand is a donor and an acceptor, what we need to do is we need to work out which orbitals are going to be involved in donation and which orbitals are going to be involved in accepting. So what are the interesting orbitals on an alkene ligand? So what we have, of course, is we have a pi orbital here. We have a pi orbital, and the other one that we have that's of interest to us is what? What have I drawn there? Well, it's pi star. So it is pi star orbital. So the pi star orbital is a bit linear here, but essentially what you've got is a pi star orbital. And of course, here you've got to be out of phase. So that is our pi star orbital, and that is our pi orbital. Now what we will have is exactly the same transition metal orbitals that we have looked at for carbon monoxide and we've looked at for phosphines. So we have an unoccupied orbital which is lying in this plane here. Exactly the same way we have our unoccupied orbital laying in this plane, which if we're looking at an octahedral environment will be the EG, one of the EG set. And of course, we have an occupied orbital which is laying with this geometry. So what you get in the bonding of a transition metal to an alkene ligand is a donor interaction with this occupied orbital going into the vacant orbital like that. And you have an acceptor interaction where electron density is flowing from the metal into the pi star orbital. And so you can see here, the temptation is for students to take this and bond it end on because that's the way the CO, and you can do the acceptor interaction if you do that. But if your alkene is bonded end on, it is not going to be possible to have a donor interaction. So the uh, alkene ligand bonds face on because only by bonding face on can you have an acceptor and a donor interaction in these species. So those are the interactions that are important. If we're being really strict about this, what is the symmetry of this interaction with respect to the metal ligand axis? What sort of molecular symmetry does it have? This interaction here with respect to the metal ligand axis. Well, it's a sigma interaction, isn't it? So this is a sigma interaction. Now what does it say here? It says that an alkene is a pi donor. Now you've encountered pi donors before with Dr. Clayton, haven't you? Pi donors are ligands that donate electron density to the metal with pi symmetry. This is a pi donor in the sense that it is donating pi electron density to the metal. But the symmetry of the bond is sigma. I hope that doesn't muddy things too much, but it's worth explaining for those of you who say to me, well, that's not a pi donor interaction in the sense that we've seen them before. No, it's not. It has sigma donor, uh, sigma symmetry, but it is donation of pi electrons into a vacant orbital. Here we have no such issues. These are obviously pi star orbitals, and this is pi symmetry with respect to the metal ligand axis. Very briefly, what we've got is a lot of waffle on, on this slide, but essentially what we're saying here, let's actually use this. So you've got a couple of slides that explain this in some depth. If we're having donation of the alkene electrons to the d orbital, that does very little to the alkene bond. Okay? Does very, very little to the alkene bond. Doesn't weaken it, doesn't change it very much at all. However, if you've got back donation of electron density from the metal into a pi star orbital. You know all about this. What is that going to do to the metal, sorry, to the carbon carbon bond? If you donate into its antibonding orbitals, what are you doing to the carbon carbon bond? You're stretching it, yeah? You are weakening it. You are basically moving towards a situation where you no longer have a carbon carbon double bond, but you have a carbon carbon single bond. And similarly, you're moving from a situation where if we draw it as a perfect alkene, you have an sp2 hybridized carbon atom. You're moving towards an sp3 hybridized carbon atom. So you expect 
a couple of major effects to happen in the structure. You expect the carbon-carbon bond to increase in length and you expect the angles around the carbon atoms to move from 120 degrees towards 109.5 degrees. And that's what you get. You find a, a range of situations where your alkene ligand, which is always a two electron donor, sometimes your alkene ligand is bonded just like it's bonded to an alkene. So it's mostly a donor interaction. In the extreme situation, where you have a lot of back bonding to the metal, then it's not so much like a donor interaction at all. It becomes like two sigma bonds to the extreme ends of your alkene. And under those circumstances, where you've got extensive back donation of electron density, you break the carbon-carbon double bond, and you make a metallocycle. And those are simply just two extremes of how much back donation is present in your molecule. And that is essentially the point that's on the slide there, and the point that we wanted to get to at the end of this lecture. So remember, you all need to be able to explain the bonding of carbon monoxide, of phosphenes, and of alkenes to transition metal centers. <laughs>